right, so we'll get going here. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Dr. Tessie. He gave me a bunch of slides that have adapted from, from a lot of his previous uh, PowerPoints. So we're just going to go over a small topic like diabetic retinopathy. So um, something we rarely see, but uh, no, just um, pretty common. This is bread and butter retina. Um, you know, it's a pretty, it's a relatively large section. It's almost a whole chapter, and uh, because it's pretty important, and it's getting more and more prevalent. So we'll just get started. Here's my disclaimer. I will leave it up for a second. <laughs> These are my views. The Department of Defense had nothing to do with this. All right. So just a few facts about diabetic retinopathy. First, it's more common in type one than type two diabetics. Um, and it's the most prevalent cause of legal blindness in younger people. Um, the risk factors for diabetic retinopathy are duration with, and these are both from the Wisconsin Epidemiologic Study on Diabetic Retinopathy, or the WSDR. So there's a bunch of studies which we'll all go through, um, and I've got slides for each one of them, but the studies are kind of a large section of this, uh, of this so we'll go through each one individually. Um, but after 20 years, 99% of type 1s will have diabetic retinopathy, and 60% or 60% uh, will have diabetic retinopathy of type 2s. So, um, and then if you look at after 20 years, 50% of type 1s will have proliferative diabetic retinopathy, um, whereas only about a quarter will have it after 25 years for type 2s. Okay. And then poor metabolic control is obviously a big risk factor. And then there are all these other risk factors, pregnancy, uh, hypertension, which was shown by the UKPDS study, um, nephropathy, obesity, anemia um, have all been shown. So, And feel free to stop me with any questions. Just raise your hand or say excuse me, or I'm just going to kind of keep going through this. So the pathogenesis, all these things lead to endothelial site, uh, endothelial damage and pericyte damage, which is kind of the end game vascular occlusion events. So increased platelet adhesion, there's erythrocyte aggregation, abnormal lipid levels, um, local uh, upregulation of VEGF, um, viscosity problems, there's a huge inflammatory component to uh, diabetic retinopathy. And then you get local abnormal levels of growth hormone as well. Okay, So all of those end up causing uh, significant damage. Um, and that leads to the entire process. So that these are kind of the very first steps that you get with hyperglycemia, and these end up causing the damage that then starts the whole cascade. So then you get this microangiopathy, which is you get the loss of the pericytes, which are what regulate and keep the endothelial cells healthy, keep them functioning well, keep the blood retina barrier, blood brain barrier intact. Um, and once you lose those, then the endothelial cells can proliferate, become abnormal and leak fluid. Um, you can get thickening of the basement membrane, and then you end up getting these occlusion events um, on the capillary level. So you get capillary occlusion. Um, and then once you get these occlusions, then you start to get AV shunts, which is what you can see with uh, interretinal microvascular anomalies once they get severe enough. Um, but before that, you'll even have small shunts that are obviously not noticeable. You'll get capillary dilation in areas that still have good capillary function, and so you'll get some shunting of blood so that you continue to get normal blood flow from the artery to the vein. And so these, those capillaries kind of take up extra responsibility, which can lead to leakage of, of fluid. And then you can get neovascularization, which is kind of the end game for us, um, where you get new vessel formation due to anti-geogenic factors. You can get it on the disc, you can get it in the retina, and then you can also get these shunts in the anterior segment, as you guys all know, okay? So, what causes vision loss? So, capillary leakage or macular edema is a huge um, reason for vision loss, okay? So that's probably one of the most common causes of vision loss in diabetic retinopathy that's mild to moderate. The severe vision loss is less associated with macular edema, uh, edema excuse me, and more with macular ischemia or uh, sequelae from proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But the number one cause of vision loss in diabetics overall is gonna be macular edema. And that's what we see at the VA, we see it here, and that's what we're treating most of the time. Um, and why we use so much avastin, lucenis, and ilea. 
So you can also get capillary occlusion, which is going to cause, cause macular ischemia. And just that ischemic process would cause vision loss, um, and that is irreversible. So that's um, a big thing we try to avoid. Um, and it also tell you whether or not you're going to respond to anti-VEGF therapy if you have corresponding macular edema. It's how much ischemia they have, because that's going to limit their final uh, visual improvement, even if you can get rid of the edema. Excuse me. That also causes diabetic papillopathy, the, uh, the capillary occlusion. And then you've got your sequela from, uh, from you know, vascularization, which is mostly surgical in nature, and you have your vitreous hemorrhage, which is probably the most common cause of severe vision loss in diabetics. And then you have your tractional retinal detachments, and also neovascular glaucoma can cause significant vision loss, so your neovascular complications there. So for classification, you all know it's non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, what also used to be termed background diabetic retinopathy, so you see BDR a lot, um, but uh, the technical term should be non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It's more specific. And then you've got your mild, moderate, severe, very severe categories. And we'll go into each of those, what defines each of those, um, and then we'll, and at the end we'll talk about the follow-up based on the different forms of diabetic retinopathy, which makes a, a difference in how often you see these patients. And then proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and you know the most common terminology is low risk versus high risk. Um, and we'll talk about the study that that came out of and what cons constitutes high risk versus low risk, what constitutes treatment thresholds and things of that nature. Questions so far? Okay, just wanna make sure. So non-proliferative, diabetic retinopathy, uh, the microvascular changes are limited to the confines of the retina, um, otherwise they would be proliferative with new blood vessels growing into the spaces they're not supposed to be. The characteristic findings, most commonly you'll see microaneurysms, and these are typically the first things you'll see. And dot blot hemorrhages, you can get retinal edema, heart exudates, um, dilation and feeding of the retinal vessels, um, which at first I didn't know exactly how to see, but once you've seen some, it becomes pretty obvious. Interretinal microvascular anomalies or IRMA, neurofiber layer infarcts, and then capillary, areas of capillary non-perfusion, which are really best seen if you have a fluorescein. Sometimes you can tell there's areas that are non-perfused, but fluorescein is the best way to see that. And then again, it can affect uh, either through macular ischemia or macular edema, the vision. This is the, obviously the most common form of diabetic retinopathy is not delivered. So for mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, they really only have scattered microaneurysms. They can, you know, some people would debate and say they can have maybe one or two dot blot hemorrhages if you see them and they're very small, but uh, the classical teaching is that it's microaneurysms only will be mild diabetic retinopathy. And then if they have microaneurysms and dot blot hemorrhages with more than 20 of both of them combined in any, in all, in any field, the, that would be considered moderate diabetic retinopathy. So um, for a while they used to count these things. I don't know, I didn't go to a uh, residency. It's pretty hard to classify some of these based on the exam because you, know, you can't sit there and stare at a quadrant and count. Yeah. You know, I mean, you sort of get a gestalt feeling by looking at it, and that's from a practical standpoint, that's typically what they yeah. do. Um, but yeah, if you do a good diabetic series of photos, you can read them and then probably better classify them. Yeah. It's a lot easier to do that than the application. Basically, if there are a lot, I usually say moderate, or if there are more than one or two dot blot hemorrhages, I'll call it moderate. If there are a few dot blot hemorrhages, I usually just call them out. Kind of as a practical if you're doing an exam. And then the severe. Um, that's the 4 two, one rule. And again, we'll talk about the study that that came out of. We'll go through it again here. But if you have four quadrants of diffuse MAs or dot blot hemorrhages, so basically everywhere you have a lot of diabetic retinopathy, um, just background stuff. And if you have two quadrants of venous beating, or if you have one, any interretinal microvascular anomaly, that puts you in the severe category. And it's very important to look for those features. So really, you're looking for a ton of 
background retinopathy, you're looking for venous beating, and you're looking for intraretinal microvascular anomalies and neovascularization when you're doing your exam. Because any of those are going to put you in a category where you have to be more concerned about the patient. Okay? And again, we'll talk about why, but it increases their likelihood of progressing to proliferative significantly. And then very severe, obviously, if you have two of those criteria, they're at extremely high risk. Okay? So severe, it's about 15% will progress within a year to proliferative, and with very severe, it's 45%. So you got a coin flip if they have very severe retinopathy that they're going to have proliferative retinopathy within a year. So now we'll go into macular edema, which is a second part of the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and some important definitions. Okay, clinically significant macular edema came out of the ETDRS study, and we'll review all the criteria for what's considered CSME. Okay, and that was used. That's used mostly for. Um, it was used for studies and until more recently, and now they're using OCT criteria, which will be the center for involving macular edema. Um, but initially, that's what it was used for, and then also it was used to guide treatment for laser. Okay, it's not so much used to guide treatment for anti-VEGF. Um, you typically use a, a central involving, a center involving macular edema um, criteria. So that's based on OCT if the fovea is thickened or not. So you'll hear us talk a lot about whether or not the center is involved as to whether or not someone will be treated. So we're not just saying if there's any swelling, you have to treat it. it depends on where it is, what their vision is, uh, you know, how whether they have edge dates or not, because that'll they'll change your your uh, um, your paradigm on whether or not you're going to treat these patients. So then you've got two other terms: focal macular edema and diffuse macular edema, and that's dependent really on fluorescein criteria. Okay, so if you look at these patients and you do a fluorescein, I'm sure you've all seen enough fluorescein now, that you can sometimes you'll be able to pick out individual microaneurysms in the beginning and then they'll leak late. And other times it just seems like everything just kind of starts leaking. Um, and that's the difference between focal and diffuse. Okay, and it's a fluorescein criteria. And it really decides if you were to do laser what type of laser you're going to do. Okay, and we'll talk about the difference types of laser as well. Questions so far? Okay. So macular edema treatment. So you've got your pharmacologic, which is our most common, and you've got your anti-VEGF medica medications there, including macogen, um, although none of you have ever seen macogen used, um, neither have I. Uh, but um, it was, well, I did it, I did it in med school. Sentence trials, but um, not used really by anyone that I know of anymore. It was a, the original VEGF inhibitor, and it inhibited only one isoform, which is VEGF 165 alpha. So, not something you need to know, but uh, it was much significantly less effective than any of the other compounds. So, once Lucentis was approved, um, or ranibizumab was approved, macogen use dropped and pretty much isn't used. And then you've got your corticosteroids. Um, and you've got intravitreal triamcinolone, which in the US we use triacids, unless you want to wash analog, which you can do. Um, and then you've got your dexamethasone implant, which is the Ozodex that most of you are familiar with. And then there's a new one, the fluosinonide implant, 190 micrograms, and that's alluvian. And that was approved for DME. And at this point, that's all it's approved for. So they're working on getting approval for uveitis, but right now the approval is for diabetic macular edema. And interestingly about this, it's the only uh, it's it's the only medication that has an or it's the steroid that has an indication that you can't use it unless you've already used a previous another steroid, mm -hmm. and they have to have a documented non-steroid response. From the insurance company. Uh, that's the, that was the FDA approval. Oh. So the FDA approval states that they must have had a steroid and not had a steroid response prior to using the Lumia. And does it last longer or what's the benefit? It's 36 months. Oh, wow. So it does. It lasts much longer. Oh, wow. um, so it's a non biodegradable implant. Yeah, so it's a little teeny plastic. It's a fraction of and size it's, of it's yeah, it's I mean it's one not even one tenth the size of Roger Dex. Oh, wow. It's teeny teeny. 
um, and but it doesn't biodegrade, it just sits there, it's plastic. Usually it's pretty difficult Usually to see. Usually I've only used it on one patient and I'm not very impressed with it, but this, for me the criteria for that is usually people who have responded well, say Octrodex, but I'm repeatedly having to do them every three months. You know, and they do okay, but it's another Roger, it's another Roger, you know, so it's okay. Steroids work well in them, let's try something that's a long duration to avoid the injection. Yeah. So that would be your primary injection. Right. You're never going to use it initially. That's, it's about $10,000. Yep. So in the long run, it, you know, you're not likely to get an insurance company to okay it unless you've shown that you've got a good response. Well, you just injected at the just like, it's got a little yep, injector. it's got a little injector just like Audrey Dax, except smaller. Yeah, smaller. That's like 27 gauge, I think. Yeah, I think it's 27. It's a tiny little thing. It's very hard to see. So when you load this, up, you push it up into this little window, and you have to make sure that it's in this little window. So I guess I've got something that yeah. I'm unloaded. Because you're never going to see it again. Yeah. <laughs> once, like, seriously, once you and then you inject it in the eye, and then it's very difficult to see in the eye. So it sits over the parts yeah. of the brain. It's very small. So. In there, yeah, you got, you got to you got to assume it's in there, pretty much. Um, and the effect takes longer to kind of come on because it's a very slow release. So a lot of at least you know from a practical standpoint, the uh, a lot of people who've used it have said that they need to treat continuously with anti vegf or with some other medication while the effect is taking on over you know a couple of months. Whereas Ozzard actually get a response within a month. Alluvian, it's like three, four, six months until you're kind of reaching the maximal response that you would expect to get. Um, so sometimes it will get worse when you transition to Alluvian. At least that's that's kind of the, the dogma right now. Was the but it's pretty early. Things, so. You know, a lot of these are just being put in, so we, we, you know, other than the study patients, we don't have good data over the long term of how the, you know, how macular edema does with but it's exciting to be able to, for some of these chronic patients who are constantly getting injected every three months, um, who are pseudophagic, who don't have any problems with getting an Ozerdex or trying try to send along to go ahead and put this in and you know have them be able to have some long-term effect. And then you've got your laser, and you've got focal laser and grid laser. Okay, and the difference between focal and grid is um, whether or not you're targeting focal edema or diffuse edema. So focal is you literally are shooting the individual microangulisms. You're trying to whiten them slightly, um, which over time will allow them to stop leaking and will clot, it'll clot them off, and then uh, the, the leakage will improve. Whereas grid laser, you're just grid it, you're just creating a grid about one half to one spot uh, in, in, in uh, spacing between them, and they're about usually 50 to 100 micron spots um, in the area of edema. You're just saying, I'm just going to grid the whole area. And focal has been proven to be more effective. So if you can do focal, you should be doing focal. And if there's really nothing to target and your patient really, really, really wants laser, then grid's a fine way to go. But focal's more, uh, more, effect more effective in treating macular edema over the long term. So now we'll go into proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So proliferative diabetic retinopathy comes in four flavors. Um, if you you know, or proliferative, uh, you know, eye disease from diabetic retinopathy. Neovascularization of the disc, NVD. Neovascularization elsewhere, NVE. Um, neovascularization of the iris, and neovascularization of the ankle. Okay, so those are the four types. Um, neovascularization, excuse me, neovascularization of the disc is defined as neovascularization within one disc diameter of the disc. Okay, so even if it's not directly touching the disc, if it's within a disc diameter of it, that's considered um, neovascularization of the disc. That's important because the criteria for when to treat are based off size, and the sizes vary between neovascularization of the disc and neovascularization elsewhere, whether you have vitreous hemorrhage. And again, we'll go into all the studies, which I'll tell you about the treatment uh, protocols. So PDR has multiple stages. So you get uh, extraretinal fibrovascular proliferation, proliferation, and the first you get new vet blood vessels with just kind of a very minimal fibrous matrix um, that 
they have to grow inside their, their extracellular matrix. And then you get increased size and extent of these vessels, and you can even get pericyte formation on the vessels um, where they're more mature. Um, and then you'll get more fibrous tissue and more extracellular matrix coming in with those. Um, and then eventually you usually will get regression leaving that fibrovascular proliferation and you'll get contraction, which is what can cause retinal attachments um, and, uh, and vitreous hemorrhages as, that, as that's contracting, you can tear those blood vessels with vitreous hemorrhages. So that's the most common um, pathway there, those three stages. Okay, number two, I mean, I think you've been with me when we're seeing in the operating rooms and the avascular complexes by this tissue and some of these traction attachments where the blood vessels can be bigger than the yeah. vessels like be massive. Yeah, we um, we had one that we were, we were dissecting for an hour because we thought it was a stalk coming up with a, a, a all along the superior arcade because there was just this vessel that looked exactly like the arcade that was running in the exact same thing. And finally, when we got to it and we figured out that the retina was actually down below it, it was a vessel that was definitely larger than the in the arcades. So they can get pretty robust over time um, and very mature, you know, normal, normal-ish blood vessels, even though they're in a the wrong location. And it's tough to tell because you've got all that fibrous posterior hyoid and, um, and so it you can't see underneath it so you don't know if that's a retinal vessel or not. So, so here's kind of some typical pictures of PBR, you can see just a little bit of neovascularization of the disc, and then some neovascularization of the disc with some with some fibrosis there uh, on the right. And then in the middle, you've got a couple more areas of neovascularization elsewhere. Um, and then you've got some neovascularization with some fibrous tissue, and then you've got mostly fibrous tissue down in the bottom right, where you get that tractional appearance. And that, that, that'll, that is what will lead to tractional attachments. Okay, is that really fibrosis? And Lot of, uh, a lot of contraction. So treatment, what do we do for proliferative diabetic retinopathy? Well, still the treatment paradigm is laser. Um, pen retinal photocoagulation was, uh, was created uh, or was performed first in the diabetic retinopathy study or at least uh, validated first in the diabetic retinopathy study, I should say. And they used greater than 1,200 spots 500 microns in size and separated by one half burn width was what they were trying to create. Um, it destroys the ischemic retina, which decreases demand, um, and it increases oxygen tension from increased diffusion. So you actually can measure the vitreous oxygen concentration. It goes up significantly locally over these areas that you that you do laser on, um, and so you get better uh, better diffusion from the choroid you're taking out some of the RPE, you're taking out the overlying retina, so it allows it to diffuse, and then also there's decreased demand in that area. So that all that ends up translating into decreased angiogenic factors, which will allow new vascularization to regress over time. Um, and the DCRC net noted that there's no statistical difference between, um, between single session, all 1,200 spots, or, uh, or multiple session, P PRP. Um, now, obviously, if you're using like a pattern scanning laser, 1,200 spots is not going to be sufficient. Okay, one, your spot size is not 500. Okay, normally, if you're doing PRP, you should have a 200 micron spot size on the laser because most PRP lenses are around a two uh, two times magnification. So you're going to double the size. So if you're going for 200, because you can't usually set 250 then you're gonna get about a 400 micron spot size, so you figure you got to up the number of spots a little bit. And then even with that, they've shown that the pattern scanning is a little, you need a few more spots, probably because some of them aren't taking. Um, because you're using, well, if you're using a multiple spot pattern, you've got nine, if you get seven takes, you're gonna feel like that's pretty good, but over you know, 1,200 spots, you're gonna be short two, three, four hundred 400 spots. So yeah, the reason the 500 micron is back in the DRS, there were no, there were no like broken stock or white eye, everything was done was a three mirror lens. So it was a direct view. So if you stood it on 500, it's a 500 micron yep. spot. So there was no magnification effect. Like now we have yep. these inverted wide angle lenses. So. 
So the bottom line is that's what you're looking for is somewhere around that level. Um, and then obviously if you're using the, you know, the usually I see that the uh, Pascal is usually set to 100 microns, which is fine if you want to do that. You can do 100 micron spots, but you're going to have to do many more. You can't figure that 1500 is total PRP. That's not even near enough. You're going to probably have to get to 2500, 3000 shots. So um, sometimes you'll do that though if patients feel it. If you decrease the spot size, you can decrease the power and the duration quite a bit, and they won't feel them as much. So. So sometimes you have to do that, but if I if I can, I usually start with a 200 spot size. And then you've got your pharmacologic, um, your anti-VEGF treatments, and protocol S from the DCRC net noted non-inferiority to PRP, okay? And in some instances, questionable superiority. Although that's, you know, I think debatable. They're using area under the curve for visual acuity. So they looked at patients who had DME and who didn't. And if they had DME, if you took the vision area under the curve, they did better. So they did, you know, somewhat better, but never statistically significantly better over any time point. But if you take all the time points together and add the area under the curve, then they made visually visual significance. So the question is, is that clinically significant to patients? If they're seeing one or two letters better every visit, it never meets that statistical criteria for the individual visit. Um, and so, you know, some people say yes, that's absolutely significant, and that's quality of life measure over the entire study. And others say, you know what, you didn't ever show that any time point was better. So um, questionable there, but they did also have a decreased rate of vitrectomy in patients who had um, who had uh, the ranibizumab as opposed to those who had laser. So it was, I think, 6% or 7% versus 18%. Um, so, so they had a significantly decreased risk of needing uh, vitrectomy for, for vitreous hemorrhage. But they, the, the, it, the basic of the study was that it was not inferior. They didn't really prove any superiority. But there were certain criteria that they said, well, it seems like maybe it's superior in this aspect or this aspect. But definitely not, not a bad option, especially if someone has concurrent DME. It doesn't, you, you don't necessarily have to PRP right away. You can say, I can treat, as long as they're going to come back, I can treat for a few months with anti-VEGF, the neovascularization that will regress at the same time I'm treating the DME. And then down the road, we can do PRP. And the reason that's important is because it's been shown, PRP has been shown to increase macular edema in both the DRS and the ETDRS studies. Um, and, they, and they did focal before PRP or simultaneously in those studies and showed that it decreased the rate of macular edema and vision and transient vision loss. So you can get a transient increase in, in CME, or excuse me, in DME when you treat with PRP, especially if you do a full session. So that's where they, they said that they were equivalent doing a full session and, and separate sessions. But there was kind of a sub-analysis that showed that doing multiple sessions, you might get a decreased risk of transient vision loss. But over the long run, it doesn't affect visual acuities in any way. It's just a short-term uh, short spike in macular edema. So again, if you can't wait for PRP, you can treat with, you know, they said treat with focal grid and then do some PRP or treat with anti-VEGF agents and do PRP in a week or two weeks or even simultaneously. Questions about that? All right, it's quiet this morning. Okay, maybe I'm just that boring. I don't know. Um, so, surgical management of diabetic retinopathy. Um, this is what gets us excited. Uh, you know, indications for vitrectomy, uh, non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage, um, anything. Uh, greater than one to six months. Um, and that was shown by the diabetic retinopathy study that patients did better, especially type one patients with early vitrectomy as opposed to waiting greater than six months or even greater than a year. So they, uh, um, they determined that it's, it's superior to, to not wait that long. Um, if they have a tractional retinal detachment that's involving or threatening the macula, if there's a combined rheumatogenous tractional detachment, then you definitely need to do something. 
Um, recurrent vitreous hemorrhage despite maximal PRP. We see that reasonably. You know, I'm sure all of you have seen plenty of people on call who seem to have as much PRP as possible. Um, you know, and been seeing us for years, and they come in with hemorrhage every now and again. And, um, if it doesn't clear, it's certainly a reason to, to go ahead, or if it's just happening frequently enough that it's bothersome. Um, and then usually you can find some areas to do a little more PRP. But even if you can't, they've, been sh they've, they've shown significant decreased time of VEGF sitting in the eye with, uh, um, with vitrectomy. So you're going to remove all of the angiogenic factors that are likely causing these little tufts to be there, and you're going to take any traction off any remaining tufts. So it has, it can definitely decrease the rate. Um, and they also think it may improve macular edema. For, I think um, that has a lot to do with it. When, you, when we do vitrectomies, um, you know, it's rare that they have the vitreous detached. Most of these diabetics, their eye went pretty well stuck. And even in eyes that have had a lot of PRP and there's no obvious demathrization, when you're in the operating room and you're getting the vitreous off the retina, it's very common to get little hemorrhages from probably little largely regressed areas of neo, but they're not 100% regressed, and once you start getting traction off, they lose and bleed. So it's probably what's happened I mean, clinically. The vitreous kind of pulls these little areas of pop and bleed, even though there's not a lot of obvious vascularization on the exam, but there's still vitreous attached there, and there doesn't take much. Sometimes it's very anterior stuff, too. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and so you'll get decreased uh, you'll get decreased VEGF as well in the vitreous, so you can get some of those blood vessels or even the macular edema to improve because, you know, people worry about the anti-VEGFs being washed out quicker, but more than anything, it's actually the VEGF itself that is allowed to clear faster because it's not sitting in the vitreous. And they've shown some good studies of significant decreased VEGF levels after vitrectomy. So, um, and then, if they have go cell glaucoma, that's a indication for uh, for. Um, have any of you seen go cell glaucoma before? I've seen yeah, I've seen several. You know, we, I, most of the time people don't let vitreous hemorrhages go that long, but even small hemorrhages that have settled can end up giving somebody go cell glaucoma, and you you really do. It looks you can kind of see these khaki cells. They're floating around. They've got this vitreous hemorrhage, and their pressure will be forty. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting, and it's just the hemoglobinized red blood cells. And that's kind of, for board purposes, that's the buzzword. If, they, if you say khaki colored cells, that's what it is. You can just find go cell glaucoma and move on. You don't have to look for anything else. There's nothing else they're gonna ask you that has khaki colored cells, okay? Um, and then NVA, NVI, without the ability to perform PRP, sometimes people have such bad neovascularization of the iris that they just don't dilate, and you can't do, you really can't do any PRP, and so that would be an indication to take them to surgery, open that up, do full end of laser PRP after you're done with the training. And then if they have a dense subhyoid hemorrhage like this guy, then you would consider it because that's going to not clear for quite a while. So he may have you know, fingers vision for a year. Any questions about any of those? Well, you know, the, the second bullet from the bottom, uh, now that we have anti-VEGF, a lot of these NBIs, mm -hmm. you can temporarily get to clear pretty well, pretty rapidly, actually, with a you know, massive injection. Um, you still, in the long run, need to get good PRP in them, so yeah. you can take them. What, what do you think, Dr. Teske, about that? There are, there are some people that I've, that I've seen or who advocate doing anterior chamber uh, Avastin or anti VEGFs instead of vitreous if they have I, just you know, I don't know. I've, I, I've not injected the anterior chamber. Yeah. Um, I think you get a good response from injecting the vitreous cavity. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the VEGF is probably the coming from the posterior segment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I don't think injecting the anterior chamber, I think you can get a good response in the vitreous cavity. But yeah. I don't know. I've just seen some people say. talk about doing that. I, you know, I, I haven't seen it happen, but I figure the clearance might be too quick as well. All right. Now, onto the studies. This is the 
the fun stuff, okay? These are the studies that you need to know. The last one, it just got put in this year, and it, it doesn't have a section on studies. It's just kind of in a lot of in the macular edema and a few other places. They just kind of talk about protocol B, protocol D. So we'll go through the protocols that they discuss and not any others, except for protocol S. They did not, uh, they said it's in, they said protocol S is in enrollment and they've enrolled 305 patients. So as of when they created the book, it hadn't, they hadn't had any even preliminary results from, from the PER with only anti-VEGF, which is protocol S. But the other ones you definitely need to know, the DRS, DRVS, UKPDS, ETDRS, DCCT, and the D, <laughs> DCRC. So it's a bunch of uh, letter, letter madness, word salad stuff. But, um, the, and those are the dates that those trials were initiated. Um, those are not the dates they were completed. The UKPDS wasn't complete until 2008. I mean, it's or 2000, yeah, 2007. It was a 30-year study, um, which is pretty awesome. I mean, you don't get very many ophthalmology studies that are longer than a year or two years. So we can get anything out five, even ten years. We're doing pretty well, uh, you know. And that's been one of the major complaints about ophthalmology, you know, until more recently, is that the studies weren't there for a lot of the things we were doing, um, and we just had you know small or retrospective or you know very very small randomized controlled trials for a lot of the things we're doing, but I think we're getting better with that. Um, and especially I think in retina, we're, we're getting better with having better studies for some of the things that we do. And we'll go through each one of these individually and we'll go through what they were and what the results were. So you don't have to write all of them down right now. So the diabetic retinopathy study, what was it? So it was, is PR, you know, one of the big, the big question was, is PRP an effective treatment for diabetic retinopathy? Okay. So what they did was they did PRP to one eye of patients with advanced PDR, NPDR, or who had PDR in both eyes. Um, they had 1,700 patients, and then they followed them out after they did full PRP in one eye and I observed the other. And they saw a 50% decrease in severe vision loss over five years, okay? So PRP doesn't eliminate vision loss. Um, and you know, so you, gotta, you definitely need to counsel patients when you're doing PRP or when they have PDR that no treatment is going to eliminate the risk of them having a vitreous hemorrhage, needing surgery, further vision loss down the road, macular ischemia, macular edema. I mean, you know, it's not a treat PRP and you're good and bye-bye. And they need to know that, especially for the type ones, because they're 40 years old, they're 35 years old, and you know you're they're you're gonna be seeing them for 30 years, and they'll probably be blind at some point. I mean, it'll probably continue to progress. They'll get continued macular ischemia, and they'll end up being legally blind if they have bad PDR and early macular ischemia in their 20s or 30s. So you really got to hit home, control your sugars, because that's what's gonna keep you seeing for as long as possible. Okay. So what did it show? So DRS said that high risk PDR was if they had mild NVD with vitreous hemorrhage, moderate or severe NVD with or without vitreous hemorrhage. So that's one third to one quarter of the disc area. Um, it's there's a standard photograph, standard photograph 10A, which is they said if it's more than this, it's high risk. If it's not more than this, it's not high risk. And this is kind of what they decided was treatment criteria after looking at all these patients and who did the best um, with these. It was the high risk PDR patients that did the best with, that had the most decreased rate of severe vision loss. Okay, so, or if they have one half a disc area of NVE with vitreous hemorrhage. So if they had a huge NVE with none, they didn't put them in this category, although most people these days would treat that. But based on this study, this is what they decided, okay? And that is, those are important to know in terms of NVD with hemorrhage um, or large NVD without hemorrhage or NV with hemorrhage or treatable PRP. That's a test, very testable question. Or if they have three of these. So if they had, basically you could not have any vitreous hemorrhage, but if you had neovascularization of the disc and moderate elsewhere, 
could you would meet the criteria. So if you had both MVD and NVE, you would still meet criteria for PRP even if you had no interest in it. Does that make sense? Questions about that? That's kind of the big thing that came out of the DRS. They validated PRP and they gave us the criteria for high risk PDR, which is the criteria for treatment of PRP. So you can think of the DRS almost exclusively in terms of what questions they can ask you about it as a study that validated PRP and gave us criteria for the treatment. Okay, and that's really about all you need to know about the DRS. Next one is the DRVS, diabetic retinopathy vitrectomy study. So they looked at patients with severe vitreous hemorrhage and those with very severe PDR without vitreous hemorrhage. And they said it's early vitrectomy between month one and month six, preferable to deferral for a year or more in those eyes. And so they determined that type one had a clearly demonstrated benefit for early vitrectomy. Okay, type two had no benefit from at least statistical significance benefit in terms of vision, visual acuities. Um, and then they also clearly showed that uh, early vitrectomy for patients with, um, with very severe PDR without vitreous hemorrhage, it was still beneficial. So you guys don't do vitrectomy with type 2 diabetes? No, we do. This, I mean, it, it, yes. it wasn't that large of a study. Um, and there was, a, there was a trend, but not a significant. I mean, the, the only thing to take away from that really is that you don't want to delay vitrectomy yeah. type 1. Okay. For sure. Not, generally now, they're not clear within a month. Yeah. Whereas sometimes in type 2s, you can give it in type 2s. Or know, you could, you know, you could try. You know, it's there, it's clearing a little bit, maybe you can sit on them. You don't get into as much trouble with yeah. type 1s. Maybe so. you could, maybe you could, you know, try to get a little more clearing. Nobody wastes it and then do clear. Yeah, was, oh. These studies were done, this was really earlier days of the track and everything was 20 days. Yeah. It was a little bit, we didn't have anti vegf agents to help. I mean, so it was. Yeah. This, I mean, this is this is what they're going to test you on, but this is not necessarily how we practice. Sure. We had no treatment until we could do PRP, so we had to be clear. So, if you have somebody who has a vitreous hemorrhage but not have PRP, how long do you give them to clear yeah. before you get laser? In? Yeah. If, if they, they already have trouble. laser, you feel a little get more comfortable quickly. Okay. Yeah. So that's why you don't delay. But you know, nowadays we might inject them for a couple of weeks, they can clear. So there's other options, but that's what the that's what the DBRS study showed. However, yeah, we we. Pretty much if anybody goes a month or two more without clearing, most of the time, unless they've already had maximal PRP and we're just kind of sitting on them, most of the time we're taking them to vitrectomy if they're not clearing at all. Okay, if we can't get more laser in, you kind of either have to try to string them out with injections or you have to take them to surgery. So most of the time, if it's a couple months, we're taking the surgery. But certainly in type one, if they've had no laser, you know, you're waiting a few weeks maybe a month and then you're saying it's time to time to clear this out and get laser in before type 1s tend to have a more fibrovascular contraction tractional detachment components but this is what they'll add, they'll test you on is what it, you know the, the DBRS showed X and it'll give you showed that the, you know vitrectomy is good for type 1 and type 2 type 1 only type 2 only so that's what it's going to be There's some PDR that uh, would be some of them would be fun to, to work on. So the ETDRS that's a uh, um, had three major goals: compare early photocoagulation versus deferral of treatment. Um, who that had basically NPDR or or early PDR. So they're trying to say is earlier treatment than what the DRS showed beneficial. Then to evaluate uh, photocoagulation, focal laser for diabetic macular edema, and determine the possible effects of aspirin, okay? So there were 3,700 participants. That's not really, I mean, I don't think they're gonna ask you how many people are in any of these studies, but um, <laughs> it's technically in the book, so it's technically fair game, but it's not a minutia I would remember. Um, but knowing kind of the inclusion, exclusion criteria, who they were, the population they were treating is probably important. So knowing that it's patients who didn't meet DRS criteria, 
treating them didn't improve, and then the macular edema, okay? So they had to have relatively good visual acuity, and then they were randomly assigned, okay? So they defined that 4 2, one rule, okay, for severe, very severe, so that's important to know. That's from ETDRS, and they also defined clinically significant macular edema, or CSME, okay? So those are two questions that are absolutely fair game. And then their findings. They were finding, the progr they talked about the progression risk to PDR, so that's that 15, 45% for severe, very severe within a year. Um, they did show that early PRP reduced the risk of severe vision loss. Um, focal definitely improves visual outcomes and improves retinal thickness. So they defined CME and validated that focal works for it. They showed that early PRP is somewhat beneficial earlier than you know the DRS criteria. Um, but there were also down, they said, you know, you have to balance that with the downsides of decreased, you know, decreased night vision, that sort of thing. Um, and then they, sh they talked about how likely it is to progress, okay? And that kind of guides how often we see a lot of these patients is how likely they are to progress to PDR and need treatment. Okay, so questions about that? So I know that's a lot, but that's really, if you know that slide, you're good on ETDRS. So again, severe PDR, 15% chance of transition to PDR within a year. Very severe, 45% chance. They said early photocoagulation is not indicated for mild to moderate in PDR. But they said, you know, severe is kind of where you're saying maybe it is. Um, but you have to, but there are a lot of downsides. So, but they said definitely for mild to moderate, it's absolutely no go. Um, and then again, they showed that it mildly reduces vision loss in early PDR and severe, very severe in PDR. That last bullet, um, but mostly type 2 diabetics. Yeah, exactly. Really so if you have something with severe in PDR or early PDR doesn't meet the DRS criteria for PRP, you can certainly justify doing PRP in those eyes, especially in a type 2 diabetic. Um, there's indications that it would be beneficial, but it's a matter of side effects versus the yeah, benefit versus exactly. careful follow-up. Yeah. But you, 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 you can, a lot of people do. I mean, if they've already had proliferative disease in one eye and they got severe non proliferative in the other eye, a lot of people start treating yeah. the other eye. And at, if you guys do a fellowship and if you have a county hospital, that's probably what you do. Yeah. We were treating a lot of suspect. severe and very severe NPERs because they would come in and you, they hadn't come in for five years and they're probably not gonna come in ever again, maybe. So if they're there, we do one full one session PRP. And you, we'd usually just do a retrobulb bar block and then that way it's comfortable, put in 1500 spots in 20 minutes and be done with it. Sorry, so why, but why type two? Why is it? It was just something, was they, just found something they found. They oh. said the type twos seem to do, seem to have improvement, whereas the type ones really don't get a so decreased know. risk of vision loss, it's severe so vision loss. Okay. Yeah, just kind of a subset analysis. They said, well, well it seems to kind of work. On, on a, on a one of multiple choice questions, yeah. they may separate type one, type two, and you have to know that it really applies to type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So, and then they define clinically significant macular edema. This is absolutely testable. Um, so, thickening of the retina within 500 microns of the center. Hard exudate, excuse me, hard exudates within 500 microns if associated with the thickening adjacently. So even if the thickening is not within 500, if you have exudates within 500 associated with an area of thickening. And then lastly, a zone of thickening, one disc area within one disc area, okay? So if you have a disc area in size within a disc diameter, if you have 500 microns or exudates within 500 with thickening. Any questions about those? It's a lost skill because yeah. this was all based on, you know, still on biomicroscopy and fundus contact lenses. And honestly, with the 9D lens and the superfield lenses, it's not nearly as easy. It's, it's not as easy. Fundus lens on, but real contact lens, you can see this stuff a lot better. And from a practical standpoint, we do with OCTs now, we just don't do this or use this yeah. criteria much anymore, but it's still I use it on the 
Yeah, so don't have an OCT. By people asking you on so, OCT, but, is that clinically significant? That being an OCT doesn't define it. Yeah, exactly. So and that's one of It's center involving if it's OCT. Remember, like the definition. So, um, but this is an important skill, and if you can, and if you can, uh, if you can know it. Um, and try to look for it before you look at the OCT, you can really improve your skills because you can say, I see thickening or not and where you see it and then see if it corresponds with OCT. It's kind of fun. Um, and it's a good skill to have because it really makes you look and kind of assess how well you're able to see things. So, and there's a, so focal reduced CME for the risk of moderate vision loss it also increased the risk that, or increased the chance that they would have uh, improvement um, and it reduced retinal thickening. So again, it just showed that it worked. So they defined CSME, then they showed that focal worked, the 421 rule, and progression. And aspirin was worthless except for reduced cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So it doesn't affect diabetic retinopathy, but it's a good thing for patients to be on if they have a risk of coronary artery disease. DCCT, 1,400 patients, type 1 diabetics, okay? This is type 1 and type, or DCCT and UKPDS are relatively similar except they're for their patient population. Type 1 diabetics, done in the U.S., diabetic control and treatment complications trial, okay? Does intensive control of blood glucose improve progression and slow development of retinopathy? And the answer is essentially yes, okay? So that's... That's where this comes from. They had an intensive versus regular insulin protocol. And intensive significantly decreased the risk of development 76%, progression by 54 and decreased the risk of nephropathy, album, albuminuria, album, albuminuria, thank you, and uh, decreased the risk of needing treatments. Okay, so basically blood glucose control works. UKPDS. Similar, except much larger study, much, much longer, but showed they had 400, 4,200 patients with type 2 diabetes. The other thing they looked at was hypertension in the study, okay? And that's where we get that one of the big risk factors for progression of diabetic retinopathy is hypertension, okay? So intensive sugar control reduced the de development and progression of retinopathy, okay? Um, and control of hypertension also reduced development and progression of retinopathy didn't matter what you used. And they used all sorts of different uh, um, regimens in terms of treating patient sugars. But as long as they treated them well, it didn't matter. DCRC net. This is, multi this is a large group of academic and private practice centers. They do multiple programs that are developed by clinicians. Lee Jampol is kind of the head of this thing. Um, and they claim that it's more of a real world setting because they're doing it in over a large multi-center populations, private practice patients, you know, academic center placement. But it's still not, you know, it's still in, in a study. So it's not really a real world situation. And that's one of the big downsides of the protocol S study. Um, and we'll touch on that very briefly. So they have a lot of protocols, but I'm gonna go through the ones that they talked about. So they briefly touched protocol B and they macular edema treated with focal versus triamcinolone. And visual acuity was better earlier on in patients who had triamcinolone, but it was better at two years for patients who had a laser, and that was after you factored in if patients got cataracts. Even then, they still had improved outcomes from laser versus intravitreal triamcinolone. But they didn't look at any other steroids. Okay, so this is just a, does, is laser better or worse? And uh, they weren't that much different, but um, and in pseudo-faking patients, the, it was almost identical, but for those who had got cataracted and glaucoma. Protocol I was treatment of macular edema with ranibizumab and prompt or deferred laser versus those who got triamcinolone and prompt laser. Basically, they showed that ranibizumab or Lucentis or the anti-VEGFs, you can expand it to all of them um, if you'd like, uh, showed it was superior to either, um, to to laser or laser with triamcinolone. So bottom line, anti-VEGF should be your first choice for macular D. Okay? Protocol T 
was the comparative effectiveness of a flibercept as bevacizumab and ranibizumab, and this is why now you can typically generalize most of the previous studies that were done with Lucentis since it was the only approved medication for, for quite a while um, for treatment of DME, and they all had similar effectiveness, except if you subsetted out patients who had 2050 vision or worse at baseline, they did two letters better on the ETDRS chart than those who got ranibizumab or bevacizumab. Okay, but otherwise, statistically, no difference between the three agents. That one year, two years, um, and now still at three years. Okay. And then protocol D, they did a, there was a case series of patients who had uh, vitrectomy and PVD create, creation for DME. And I mentioned this because sometimes we do this, um, uh, especially Shakur talks about doing this a reasonable amount, and, and the other attendees as well. Um, for those who have refractory DME um, or, or who have an epiretinal membrane, especially to do uh, to do vitrectomy, um, and they showed retinal thickening reduction, but they didn't have any visual acuity change in those patients who had vitrectomy. Okay. Protocol P showed that patients with NPDR and cataract surgery had a risk increased risk of CME compared to controls, and then protocol Q was very similar: patients who had DME prior to surgery. So these, protocol P had no DME, protocol Q had DME prior to surgery, and it showed that both had an increased risk of worsening DME or CME, depending on what you think the etiology is, um, after cataract surgery. So it's routine, um, it's pretty routine at this point if someone has pre-existing diabetic macular edema to give them a perioperative treatment with anti-VEGF. Even if they've had a history of DME, uh, some people will choose to treat them even if they're not currently inflamed because there's a pretty good chance you can see that half of eyes had no visual acuity improvement with cataract surgery due to macular edema worsening. You know, and that was only at a couple months and, you, you know, at the long term it may have gone down to, to baseline again, but you're definitely going to be treating those patients. So treating them right before, within a week before surgery is a reasonable idea to decrease that. And then protocol S, which we talked about, was ranibizumab versus P PRP, okay? And ranibizumab was non-inferior. It may have improved visual acuity if you look at area under the curve, and there's a decreased rate of acquiring vitrectomy, okay? The downside and, you know, one of the big, uh, you know, problems or issues with this study is follow-up, okay, in a patient population. Even in the study where they, were ha they had study coordinators calling these patients, they, you know, had them all set up. They all were getting, you know, they all had insurance and were, they still had a 10% dropout rate in two years. So you can imagine somebody with PDR, if 10% of the best patients, the most likely to follow up patients are dropping out, your rate's not that good, right? It's so real world, day, so. real, yeah, they had to come in every month. They got photos every single month and they compared the photos to previous photos to see is the PDR worse, is it the same, or is it regressing? And then based on that, they would decide to treat or not. And I think the first year they got an average of about eight or nine treatments, and then over the second year they got about four, I think, if I remember right, four or five. So they got they definitely got fewer treatments as they regressed. The problem is is they're still coming in every single month, and 10% of people didn't complete a two-year study. So if you've got you know multiple diabetics in their 40s and 50s and 60s, you can imagine there'd be a lot of people walking around with PDR who are not going to come back in a in a real life the situation. The biggest concern about this is the practicality of implementing this and the compliance, and then the cost. You know, yeah. Monthly rent is is pretty pricey. Even mo even so monthly Avastin is going to be as pricey as PRP in the long run for yeah, these so. patients. So. So right now it's not. The nice thing about this everything. is a lot of times we're treating patients because they have DME first. So the progression of their PDR, and a lot of these patients are getting six, seven, eight treatments in the first year, and so their PDR on their breast. The biggest question I have is that when you stabilize them, do you need to add PRP yeah. at some point, or if your your DME is gone now? Yeah, do you want to bring it back with PRP? Do you want to bring it back with PRP possibly? Six treatments or, or seven treatments, and their their DME is gone. Yeah. 
So there's the recap for the studies, and we are about finished because I know it's, it's about that time. Um, so that's the recap there of what these studies showed, okay? Um, and then here's the recommended examination schedule, okay? So for first exam, type one, five years after diagnosis is when they should first be examined, okay? They don't need to be examined sooner than that. So if you see somebody who is newly diagnosed, tell them to come back in five years, okay? Because these patients are diagnosed at the time they have diabetes, right? You don't have very many patients go two or three years with type one diabetes because they go into diabetic ketoacidosis and aren't around anymore if they don't get the diagnosis. But type twos, they can be 10, 20, 30 years di you know, pre-diabetic or diabetic or you know, even significantly diabetic and not have been diagnosed. So at the time of diagnosis, they should have annual exams at minimum. And then when, if you're pregnant, you should, and they have a history of diabetes, you should see them at least every trimester. And that's if everything is good. If they have severe, very severe NPDR, you should be following probably every month or two months. Okay. So that's the difference, and you know, especially with type one diabetics, now you see a lot of type one diabetics who are pregnant, and even type two diabetics who are pregnant, and you have to follow them much more closely. Okay. And then the schedule on the other side is just kind of how we would follow these patients um, if that. If, based on their diabetic retinopathy, okay? So normal or minimal, 12 months. Mild, 12 months, as long as they're pretty well controlled. If they're not, you know, if their A1C is 10 or 11, we'll probably see them back at nine months, maybe even six months, just to make sure that we're having a little more engagement, telling them they need to get in control, stuff like that. Their rate of, you know, progressing to PDR in six months is minimal, but, um, but it's more for a continued follow-up, checking them for DME, because they're more likely to get all those things. Moderates, six to 12 months, and again, that depends on their control. If they're very well controlled, they've been moderate for a while, you know, 12 months or nine months is reasonable, but if they're not well controlled, six months is, is a good way to go. Severe, you know, four months, yeah, at least, three or four months. And then, you know, non-high-risk PDR, they say four months, I'm not going four months. I'm probably going more like two to three, certainly at first, if you are choosing to follow these patients and not treat them, okay? And then high-risk PDR, they're saying every four months. Um, I assume that means they're treated. You know, and this is all coming from the AAO guidelines, okay? And then involuted PDR, you can follow more, you can follow them less frequently as long as they're not active and they haven't been active for a while. So when you're first treating them, you're obviously going to be seeing them frequently. And then as they do better, you can space them out further and further. And, you know, you can probably get them back out to a year if they're, you know, had PRP 20 years ago, haven't had any vitreous hemorrhages or any other problems, and they're well controlled. But that's kind of the basis, and that's why at the VA sometimes it seems like we're randomly deciding when people are coming back. But mostly I try to go off that. Any questions for me? Sorry, I'm a huge Calvin and Hobbes fan, so <laughs> <laughs> I think I end all of my presentations with Calvin and Hobbes. I own like every single one of the books when I was a kid. All right. Thank That's you. it. Thank, Thank you guys. You guys.